Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted today to be able to speak to Michael Ulrich of uh, J.O. Hambro Capital Management, one of the UK's finest uh, large cap investors. So welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, um, given now um, inflation starting to roll over and the central banks are sort of indicating that they're uh, putting uh, further interest rate hikes on ice, what's your sort of broad outlook for equities going forward? Because obviously had a pretty tough patch, particularly of late. Yeah, I think you're inviting me to be positive. And I think, um, look, and you highlighted a couple of the positives. Yes, yeah, so accepting, you know, I'm not going to pick on, you know, you know one or two data points where perhaps inflation was a bit higher than we thought. The, the, you know, the, the trend is it's slowing, uh, and and definitely factually the you know uh, over here and over in the US uh, rate hikes have been paused, so that's a that's another positive. And then I think um, the the other thing that that's really been I think driving some of the consumer stocks is that sense that actually household balance sheets are in a better shape than perhaps you would have expected. It's that that that. Um, uh, the buffer they built up in the uh, over COVID, so you know I think I think you you start with your question sort of highlighting sort of the that's the positive stance, um, and then I'm going to be perhaps surprisingly for an equity manager uh, a bit more negative uh, than you you'd imagine in the one I think personally I think I think we are here sort of higher for longer I think the central banks are pretty pretty clear about that I think that decade long um, trend of low rates is over. Um, and in any case, the point of rate rises is is to to, to slow the economy. They they uh, and they're pretty good at doing that. And they they paused because they think they may have already uh, achieved it. If they don't get the slowing, they'll they'll carry on. Um, I think as far as the consumer stocks are concerned, I think there is you know that buffer doesn't last forever. I think it's running out, and we're we're still getting back to normal from that respect. In the US, you've got student loan repayments starting, and you know, in the here and now, we've got um, uh, higher energy costs. Uh, that feels like that's going to be a, a kind of, you know, a reasonably persistent, uh, at least in the current environment. And in the UK, although I'm not exactly sure what the government are preaching, one, one of the things they may be preaching is fiscal constraint, which is, quite, is, is different to what we're seeing in Europe and particularly the US, and we might come on to that. So uh, our, our kind of way of looking at, at the world is very much um we are uh we're a fund that we you know we're, we're, we're concentrated we, we we can talk about any of the stocks we've only got 28 mm -hmm. of them so i ought to know them um uh but we try and deliver growth for for the clients um but we do that in a fairly sort of low volatility way uh mm -hmm. so that's what that's that's what you got to end up getting so to do that we've got to look at sort of more structural growth because given that backdrop i'm sort of highlighting i don't think we can sit there and rely on the cyclical so we've got to find the structural growth drivers we're known for being a bit obsessed about sort of not losing money. So uh, we've got to do that while while we're focused on, on balance sheets. Um, we care a lot about valuation and that sort of thing. And then when you've only got 28 stocks, you can be really sort of engaged with management. And that's something mm. we, we sort of push hard on. But um, yeah. Well, let's that, talk about one of those secular growth areas then, mm. because there's certainly one out in uh, reshoring and infrastructure spend, and there's certainly the uh, the federal, uh, not the Federal Reserve, but the the government out in the US has put all these um, you know Inflation Reduction Act bills and infrastructure right. bills and spend and stuff like that. And it's been gangbuster for the infrastructure guys out there. And one player you've got in your portfolio is Ashted over there and it does you should say it combines that structural growth but also it trades at a pretty low sort of 13 times pe do you want to give us your, your, your sort of latest thoughts on this one because given where the market is it seems to be pretty resilient well i'd say so we, we've got this is a sort of theme that runs through the portfolio so um it's really important for ashley it's important for a number of other stocks as well but and and you're right the you know i thinking behind it is that sort of um infrastructure uh, trend that in itself is a, as a myriad of other things. So you you know the geopolitics you've you've highlighted, onshoring, re reshoring, nearshoring, all the stuff around that that, that is in, in many ways just sort of political. There's a, the tech um, uh, investment that we're going to need. Um, you know people talk about a lot about AI. That's quite uh, uh, power intensive. Um, not to mention sort of data centers, battery plants, uh, the reshoring of semiconductors. We could talk a bit about energy transition um, and, you know, where we started um, government stimulus. And you, you're right, those, those sort of three separate acts in the US, but also in, in the UK. And so for Ashton, um, 
you know, we, this 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 stuff in, in super terms requires requires things to be built, assets to be built, uh, infrastructure assets particularly. Uh, and Ashtad is, uh, a, you know, the big uh, uh, way I think for uh, UK investors now to to play that. And uh, US is ninety five percent of Ashtad's profits. Um, it's been growing in any case. It's you know, it's the it's the number two. It's sort of close number two in in uh, uh, in, in the US. And it, it's been taking share. So it was, you know, I've, I've known this for a long while, but um, it, its share was about sort of 4% uh, only a decade mm -hmm. ago. It's about 13 now. They've laid out really clear plans how they get to 20. And it's, it's mostly greenfield um, greenfield opening. So it's that redeploying of the, the cash flow that they're making. Um, I, this is, a, as you say, it's a, it's the valuation that really doesn't reflect the, the prospects. Mm -hmm. And it's got, it's got a track record of doing this. Um, so, you know, we, we, we think, um, we think we've got about 120 P of earnings in 24 and, and, uh, it made less than 50 in 2021. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we were, yeah, it looks like a long-term, uh, good value play. It's, it's it hard makes, to understand uh, the valuation given the, 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 you know, I yeah. think the, the long and it's got trends good. for that market. Yeah, and it must have good defensive uh, qualities because uh, it's got 27% uh, EBIT margins as well, which is, just shows you it's got that networking effect. Yeah, and no one's, you, you, we're, we're be kidding you if we said it's not cyclical, you know, the mm. construction markets, even within infrastructure, have cycles within them. The good thing about Astro's balance sheet is that it's backed by the equipment it owns. So. Yeah. You know, in a slowdown, the first thing that happens to Ashted is uh, cash flow starts to pour in. It pours in because you you, you just mm -hmm. take your foot off the brakes of buying new equipment, yeah. um, and you just age the fleet slightly. Uh, mm. And and it, so the the cash flow is kind of counter cyclical, and that's the that's the sort of the strength and the stability you get with Ashted. Yeah. Um, is that yeah they, they they kind of control their cash flow in a downturn. Mm. Another one in that sort of sector is um, CRH, which is quite topical because obviously it's moving its listing out into the States, isn't it? And so I guess, I guess this one, it, it's an aggregate building materials business, sort of tarmac and all this sort of stuff. And it trades on about 11 times PE. So I guess that this play is then not only the secular growth, but also re-rating in the States, I imagine, because it's 11 times is pretty cheap. It is, it is, um, and uh, that's just, you know, it's done very well, but it's, it's growing very well. It's you know, we think of it as a, you know, yeah, it was um, Irish listed, U, uh, UK listed, it's moved to the US. Uh, so we think of it in many ways as a sort of a, a UK and Irish uh, business, but it, it makes, uh, it's the biggest of its kind in, in, in North America. It makes um, the, the asphalt for 25% of, of US roads. So it's, it's a very big player over there and it's got a really uh, good track record of doing it. And it goes back to that, those, those fiscal um projects uh so there is increased spending on on roads but it's not just roads it's rail it's all uh, all sorts of other infrastructure um and size matters so increasingly you know federal contracts um increasingly they're sort of what they call design and build so it's not just supplying the stuff uh and there's only so many players who who are set up to do that and crh has really you know uh, uh targeted that model and they're winning you know a disproportionate share even as the biggest player so yeah, yeah, these are in any case great businesses. They're high return capital businesses. It, it's simply that you know they're in many ways they're, they're often local monopolies. This stuff doesn't transfer transport very far. So if you're the you know if you're, you're you've got the quarry in that area, you've got pricing power, and that's that's the real you know uh, attraction of, of this business with that sort of growth tailwind added to it. Yeah, no, I would agree. As I say, with the uh, all that spend by, by the US government, then it's got to help. It's got to help that industry. Now, just moving on to an engineer, which is actually not too far from where I live, IMI, which um, does sort of valves and actuators, and I think it's just split into sort of two divisions. Into um, it's got sort of the life sciences, and it's also got sort of like process automation. So it's pretty high value, and, and also for a for an engineer, it makes 19% EBIT margin. So it's obviously got a lot of IPO. What's your sort of latest on this one? Because it, again, it seems like a bit of a, a crown jewel on the FTSE 100. Yeah, and I, look, I think, um, I, you know, you hear too many people say, no, we don't make anything in the UK anymore. And, and actually we've got some great engineering companies and it's a mm. competitive market. And if you've survived this long, you're doing something well. And you're right, with those, those margins, the return on capital it makes, uh it's uh you know it, it's clearly um a world leader in what it does and what it does um, we can spend all day but in simple terms 
can think of it, it makes valves, it makes big mm. valves that go on power, uh, uh, things like sort of electric power stations or gas fired power stations and, uh, and, and in sort of up and downstream oil and gas. It makes valves that might be involved in factory automation, and it makes valves that uh, could be um, uh, in your radiator if uh, you know mm -hmm. if you've got a sort of reasonably high-end um, uh, heating system. Uh, it's very good at it, and it uh, it plays for a number of themes. So that energy piece, um, you know, it, it's it's not much talked about, um, I think, but a big part of the energy transition, particularly the carbon reduction um, uh, ambitions, is to reduce methane leakages. And IMI sell valves that help you do that, uh, and that's a growing part of their of their business. They are very likely to be playing into the hydrogen um, economy as that evolves. And then, in terms of the you know the factory automation piece, as we're seeing the the cost of labour um, go up, uh, the you know we, I think we've been through a, a a long phase in sort of Western markets where it's just been cheaper to hire people because there's been no wage inflation. Well, now it's not, and and now automation is sort of thing from back on the agenda for lots of the areas where, um, where there was an underinvestment, and there's sort of the last thing on IMI, and I'm quite fond of this is the fact that its CEO Roy Twyte has been there. He's been there 35 years. He's run every Only division. 35. 35 <laughs> years. He's run every division. He's finally got the top job, and um, he wants to invest and he wants to grow it. And he's, he's, he's mm. you know. He's, been there two or three years now, but he, he comes across as a man who's been waiting for the, you know, he, he knows mm -hmm. what what needs to happen and it, he needs to sort of free it from, I think, historically, too focused on cost efficiencies, lean engineering, it's just sort of, it, it needs, needs to think a bit more about going out there and selling and, and spending a bit more on R&D and he's done all of that. We've had a, had a you know, last that, he's, he's put a, since he's been there, we've had a 40% increase in the R&D um, uh, budget. So uh, that focus on organic growth and it's, it's paying off. Um, so very happy yeah. with IMI, especially you know, at these levels. Yeah, I would agree. And I think uh, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised if somebody has a good, given the amount of M&A across the whole uh, UK sort of sector, it wouldn't surprise if they became a target for somebody. I mean, it would be perfect for Siemens, but it, but private equity at sort of less than four billion would make a lot of sense for a roll up. Now, again, in that engineering theme, Smith's Group, which is obviously known for its x-rays and baggage control at airports, but does lots of sort of pumps with uh, John Crane as well. And lots of, again, lots of good things to like about it, sort of EBIT margin, sorry, yeah, EBIT margin 17 percent similar sort of like mid single digit organic growth as well um so it's again it's got a lot of high margin stuff solid balance sheet yeah look, and this is another one where there's been you know there has been over the last few years change at the top and i think it's mm -hmm. you know it's been a good change again a focus a bit more focus on growth less inward looking just a bit sort of braver and uh you know john crane is their, their biggest john crane is a, uh, a global leader in what it does what it does it, mm. it makes something uh, it, it also makes um uh, things that are related to valves but it makes something called mechanical seals and i'm not going to explain mm. what a mechanical seal is because again we can again to, to, you know if you're interested look them up there's videos online of this and uh but they are the a world leader in it and they're really important bits of kit they're, they're, they go on things that really uh, can't leak um, and they play to those similar sort of themes I've talked about, sort of energy transitions, a bit of it. Um, there's a hydrogen uh, angle to this, uh, and it's and you know there's still there's there's an ongoing um, much as we we know we talk about transition. There's an ongoing um, oil and gas capex cycle as as you know particularly some non OPEC uh, sorry OPEC countries you know realize that they need to get the stuff out of the ground. They're they're producing well below capacity. There may not be a market for it in in the long, uh, long, long term. Um, and we're, we've gone through a period of underinvestment. We're now seeing more investment. So, and then the detection piece, you know, it is volatile, but apart, back to those Biden infrastructure pieces, they're building more airports. So there's, I think it's like sort of 10 billion they're spending on, uh, on the terminal at um, uh, JFK. Uh, they, they will need um, more uh, baggage detection stuff. If you're lucky enough to go through an airport um, where you, you may have noticed now that they're, they're saying you can leave your liquids in the bag. Uh, yeah. Saves a lot of time. That's a, that's a Smith's detection. You, you'll see it on the, um, uh, on the machine as you go through. So that market is now, is now moving for them as well. And so like last thing to say, particularly, you know, we, we talk about sort of low volatility and capital good companies aren't, aren't known as low volatility, but for John mm. Crane, over 70% of its business is actually, um, servicing uh the equipment they've put in you know this these things can't go wrong that's really where they make the money that's the higher margin stuff 
it's half of the detection business as well um mm. so that it it's not as volatile as you might think yeah is there an unbundling opportunity here between the detection and the and the uh, john crane yeah look we i know we're, we're old-fashioned in this because we've got this sort of focus on low volatility we quite like conglomerate businesses we don't need to be carrying a business that's going backwards They're definitely not but i don't think that's true of any of the, the of the uh, of those four uh, Smith group mm. businesses. So yeah, th there is always that possibility. They did spin off their medical um, uh, unit uh, fairly recently. Many, you know, if you've got very long memory, you know, they used to have an aerospace uh, 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 piece as well. So from time to time, they'll, they'll you know, the, the history tells you they will do that. But we quite like the fact that we've got, you know, if, if something does go very wrong in detection or something, you know, mm. we, we've got four businesses supporting the balance sheet here, and it's a pretty strong balance sheet to start with. Yeah. Well, as I say, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody comes along and puts a number on them, even even the likes of Melrose, that kind of uh, private equity style. I know it sounds a bit of a sort of leap of faith, given the uh, the market cap is over five billion, but you never know in terms of uh, money. Now, again, just on the um, on the electrification and infrastructure theme, you've got two national grid and SSE, and uh, there's a bit of an unbundling here on national grid because I think they've just sold about eighty percent or sixty percent of their infrastructure. Their gas infrastructure in the uk um do you want to take us is this is this are these two just pure defensive plays because they have that stability with sort of like you know long terms long cycles yeah they, they you know utilities and, and everyone starts to yawn um uh i think actually um well one uh, uh so uh, I, I say i get excited rachel co-runs co the farm with me gets very excited about uh, uh utilities so we're, and one of the sort of you know the things we've sort of been banging on about at the moment is is that um investment that you need particularly in transmission so if you can imagine you know we're mm. building all this offshore wind we've we, yeah. we've got a fantastic opportunity in an offshore wind as the uk um we, we it, and we're we, you know we're, we're already building enormous amounts of it. in fact sse are building uh uh certainly in europe so it might still be the the world's biggest offshore wind farm as we speak uh, they've just opened actually that dogger bank yeah. haven't they as well that's just been connected to the grid so i'm guessing Na national grid have just put their transmission lines to connect it well this is the thing so ssc so when, when we talk about so when people think about the national grid it's the grid that connects um uh that's different to, in, in many ways anyway to national grid the company and ssc are kind of are uh the grid in think of them particularly in scotland uh they've got the there it's true elsewhere as well but the grid itself is divided by into three companies of which national grid is only one mm. um but scotland's really interesting because that's where you've got a lot of wind power you've got some hydro up there and it is a long the generation is a long long way uh from the people who are going to be using it um and you know previously the, we needed to connect coal-fired power stations well now you know they're not in the same place so this is a um uh, whether you you know for or against this uh, this is a lot of pylons um and and SSE get paid uh, a guaranteed return on on the, the the infrastructure that they own and build, um, and so if they, and we, we call that it's RAV, it's regulated asset uh, yeah. value. If that grows, their profits grow, and that's and we know you know you've got what's good about them is you've got visibility because they don't just plonk this stuff down; it has to be agreed. And um, all those pylons and cables and tunnels that that connect it. Well, we think um, that sort of asset base is going to grow about 75 percent between 22 and 27 and it could do the same again if you go out to about 2032 so th that's not boring that's that's no. pretty fast uh growth i think it's massively underappreciated We're... and it's presumably inflation protected as well isn't it because that because yeah. it's a regulated business they they layer in or they factor in the the cpi and then usually a, a percentage on top for extra costs into the whole return you can make completely right so there you've got your sort of inflation linked bond type of it but mm. the one that grows and it grows pretty rapidly um so yeah so we, we, we've written about this i wrote a, a piece uh i think we might i thought we titled it in the end but it was called something like sort of uh 
Pylon of the Week. There is a, a website of Pylon of the Week uh, for, for, for people. That sounds really... like one of those one of those stories on uh, have I got news for you, isn't it? Right at the end, Pylon of the Week. You, you, you may laugh. Actually, in terms of, you know, stuff we've written on, on you know, interest rates or anything else got far less sort of hits as, than, than the, the Pylon piece did very well. <laughs> So if you're, if you're like, I came back from Cornwall um, on the holiday and I did pass, uh, you can just see, I think on the M5, um, as you get sort of, you go that way through uh, past Bristol, you can see the new T pylons. Very good looking they are too. Um, I'd, I'd highly recommend about, it. One thing, about, one thing about utilities, and that this is one of the reasons why they've been hit, is obviously they're classed as sort of dividend proxies and also they've got a lot of debt. Therefore, they've got debt servicing costs. With interest rates going up and, and your thesis that, interest rates will stay higher for longer. How is that going to impact the sort of like the returns and cash generation of these large utilities who have to service these big debt piles? Well, you, you're right. So there were well, two things. One, it's very long dated. So as, as it, uh, you know, we're, they're, they're not uh, susceptible to short term changes because it's very, very long dated debt. The second thing is there's a very high element of it that's uh, also the, of the, the cost of debt that is linked in to uh, the allowed return. Just as inflation is, uh, the, the, the regulator assumes you're going to fund these things uh, with a decent proportion of debt and your allowed return goes up to, 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 take, uh, to take care of that. There's sometimes a lag, but the lag's covered by the fact that their debt's long dated. So the short answer is they'll be fine with that. That's that's you know something that's uh, all all considered in the in their sort of regulatory settlement. Okay, another one which is sort of like um, benefiting a bit from the uh, the decarbonisation is um, Anglo American, which I know has got a big part of a sort of Chile's um, copper mines out yeah. there, and also owns De Beers through its diamonds, and I think it's got an iron ore yeah um, business out in um, in Brazil. It trades at about eight times PE and has got. Well, I mean, it, it's got a good balance sheet, actually. It's been generating cash hand over fist and uh, EBIT, it, net debt to EBITDA is well less than one. Yeah, look, and, and we, we you, you've, you've got that spot on in terms of that's why we own it. We own it really for the copper assets. That's our, our, main, um, uh, our main thing here. And that is very much linked to what we need for energy transition. Um, you know, looking at spot valuation is always difficult because it's so driven by, uh, you know, commodity prices, but on uh, uh, sort of spot rates and, and assumed sort of declines, it looks pretty, pretty cheap to us. I think copper uh, is probably going to be a sort of 40, maybe more percent um, of, uh, of their sort of cash generation next year. And un unlike lots of their competitors, um, they're growing. So they're bringing on the mine in Chile. Um, They've got expansions, uh, sorry, in Peru, and they've got expansions to the mines in, in Chile uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so you've got you've got the, the um, uh, not just the, the sort of the right quantity exposure, but a growing exposure. And um, I, 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 I checked this stat before I was to a client the other day because they questioned it and it uh, and it seems so unlikely. But uh, apparently there's sort of 220, 224 um, copper mine discoveries in the 30 years to 2019. In the, in the 10 years, uh, there was only 16. So 224 yeah. in the last 10 years. And, in, and since 2015, we've, we've had one in terms of significant mine. It's harder to find these things. They're in more and more kind of obscure uh, areas. So, you know, Rio have the thing in, in Mongolia, um, Barak have one in Pakistan. They're, they're often in areas that have more difficult geology, quite often more difficult politics. So there, yeah. this is, you know, you've, got, you've got positives on the demand, positives from a supply perspective, perspective and, a, and a, an attractive valuation. Mm. Just on the um, on that copper, though, I mean, obviously, there's, there is, must be some geopolitical risk because uh, Peru and Chile have started sort of yep. like sequestrating some of their lithium mines, haven't they? Yeah. And the, <laughs> is there and, any read across into copper at some point? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, th this is why, um, so we've, at one point, some time ago, we've owned Antofagasta, which is 100% Chile. And, mm. and uh, you know, my views now, you know, we really don't, given the sort of rising political tensions, we need um, uh, geographic and political diversity. Uh, Chile is going through a sort of complicated uh, piece of renegotiating its uh, own constitution uh, and, and mining taxes are a big part of that. And they're find, trying to find the balance between how much can we extract from the companies and but still keep them wanting to invest and, 
and and, and uh, grow production. Um, so uh, you know, it's all it's kind of part of the the long term thinking is that you're going to have to. I think increasingly there is the just the right to this all the social license as much as anything to do this. You're going to have to keep paying governments uh, as part of that. But the the other side of it is it constrains supply. Uh, in, and, and we're we're really seeing that almost sort of uh, offsetting it, and it has the, the the you know that's the impact it's going to have on price. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll just uh, switch in sectors now to um, healthcare because this one has been healthcare as overall globally has actually been battered. And uh, let's do one of those really a best in class biopharma is AstraZeneca, which I think is the UK's biggest. Uh, business and uh, it trades uh, uh, surprisingly actually it, it roughly ran about sort of like um less than you know one times peg peg ratio given its growth etc because it's got big franchises in cancer oncology and uh, rare diseases and cardiovascular and do you want to take us through your latest view on this this is really sort of like a, just a big demographic sort of like elderly people type play that's 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 the start of it. Yeah, I mean, I would always start with that structural piece, and you you yeah. you know uh, more people accessing healthcare, people living longer. Uh, they're in some of the right kind of uh, areas in terms of you know oncology, so sort so, of so the the most um, uh, the most obvious one. Um, I think the other thing to think about Astra, and this is true for farm companies generally it sounds, it sounds an obvious thing but you need to have an effective r d uh department and they didn't for a long period of time uh they were you know one of the, in terms of sort of success rates they were one of the worst and it's been it's kind of improving over the last sort of decade uh it's reorganized its um uh, its research franchises it's got the sort of big the big campus in uh cambridge it's got the scandinavian one and and in, in the us so three centers uh with much better results coming out of it and that's, you know, it's taken a long time because you can't, you know, turn these things around, you know, suddenly. Um, but now you're seeing that's come through in earnings and, and really importantly now. And this is really, you know, you've had the inflection in in um, in cash flow and hopefully you get on that sort of, you know, general sort of hopper of now you're generating cash. You can it can pump, um, pump that back into the R&D piece and, and, and you know, the, the, the that, that sort of flywheel keeps turning. So I think. Astra is a sort of success story. It's um, it's it's got a good pipeline. We can see future growth. I don't think you're paying an enormous amount for it, um, yeah. and it is a you know low volatility, you know, not particularly cyclical uh, stream of revenues and cash flows that that you know kind of suit our book. Yeah, no, I would agree. If, if people want to just have have something which is a real sleep at bed, just sleep sleep at soundly at night type stock, then uh, that's one of them. Um, now another one in this in medical devices in sort of healthcare is uh, um, Smith and Nephew, which I've been tracking for some time, and it has split obviously through uh, knees and hip joints, sort of the orthopedics, but also has got sports uh, um, wound, has got sports um, injuries and also uh, wound um, uh, repair, I think. Um, and if you add those latter two together, it's about sixty percent of the business. They've got a new CEO, haven't they? And I was stunned to find the, the shares after the sell-off are trading at roughly around about 11, less than 12 times PE currently going forward. Yeah, it's it's about as cheap as I, I can remember it. And mm. um, actually, do you know, the, the, there's some logic for that. It has not been a well-run business. Um, it's yeah. had, I, I'm losing track. I think we've had four CEOs in five years. Um, that's sort of like what for football club territory, that is. Um, I think... <laughs> uh, or Chelsea manager, is it? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, either. I, but um, the, no, so it's not that it's operationally uh, fallen apart. In fact, if anything, I think it tells you it's been, uh, it's, it's a very good franchise, uh, a very good business, uh, but, you know, it needs consistent strategy. And we've got the, the, the current CEO who has sort of stayed a little bit longer, um, has a strategy that makes sense. It's much more commercial. It's much more focused on actually selling product. Uh, you're right that the sports medicine and the wound management bit is much bigger than uh, hips and knees. We people think of it as hips and knees. That's the slower growing part of it. Sports medicine is a much faster growing part, and they are leaders uh, uh, in that. And you know, the, the more people who play active sports, the more you know, the longer we live, the more uh, health conscious people are. The more they are, unfortunately, are going to injure themselves. Yeah. Um, We've probably all done that. Um, and and that is, uh, you know, a growing market for Smith and Nephew. Now, as well as a, a CEO who we've met a couple of times, who I, 
uh, I'm you know, really encouraged by. We've got a new chair who's only just started, who uh, is Rupert Soames, uh, who was uh, uh, did a fantastic job at Agreco. Um, mm. Really, you know, saved, I would say, saved Serco. Um, and if you think about it, he's not going to know a great deal about um, um, medical devices. Uh, that's not his background, but what he is very good at is um, uh, cash flow and capital allocation. And they're the things that he really fixed at Serco. And I think that's the missing piece at Smith & Nephew. Uh, it needs to improve um, what it does with its cash. To, it needs to strengthen the balance sheet. It needs to, to make sure it's generating uh, you know, cleaner accounts, more cash flow for shareholders. Um, and that is something I expect that, that we'll see. And I think that's the thing that, you know, uh, will convince people are sitting on the sidelines now because uh, it's got, all the, you know, I think we've got all the pieces in place for this to, to, to be really strong. And again, another stock that is not particularly cyclical. It has, uh, you know, it's it, as long as people need need um, need, need their, their joints fixing in and whatever they've done to themselves, uh, they, they will sell product. Yeah. And are they going to be able to turn that orthopedics um, division around? Because uh, that's been the sort of the <laughs> that's been the Achilles heel, hasn't it? For, yeah, yeah. For this business for such a long time, particularly Striker has has battered it in terms of market share with its uh, robotic sort of orthopedics or well, hips, anyway. Yeah, although actually, it, it, you're, you're, well, the, you're right. Striker has been uh, uh, significantly outperforming everybody in that market. Smith and Nephew have lost some market share, but not uh, nowhere near as. It's inc- surgeons are incredibly loyal to the product they know how to use. Mm. Uh, you really have to mess up for them to to switch. But Smith and Nephew have been they've they've got fantastic products. They don't have a product problem, uh, but they have a logistics, a supply chain. Um, and possibly a, a Salesforce issue that the new CEO is fixing. So I mean, as he explains to us, you know, they're spending, the salespeople who are meant to be out there seeing surgeons selling the stuff are spending mm. half their time uh, trying to work out where the kit is and why it hadn't been delivered. Um, yeah. Take that off their shoulders, incentivize them to actually, um, you know, bring in some sales rather than do the admin. Um, and I, I think you could see a, a big improvement in that area, but it's not product issue they've got. It's you know, it's, not, you know it's, it's an organizational yeah. issue. They've had more restructurings and changes to, to, to sort of Salesforce. And I think salespeople want to be left alone to sell things. That's that's their, that's where, and you know, we've got a, a guy running it now who I think understands that. Good. Okay. Well, another one we're moving to sort of FMCG uh, sector, another one which is sort of like uh, needs a perpetual kick up the proverbial to sort of like, you know, shake up the management team, Unilever and uh, maybe even Diageo. Do you want to take us through sort of Unilever? Because obviously it's well known for its uh, Dove soap and uh, yeah. Magnum ice cream and Persil powder and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, Unilever is one of those businesses where, you know, there's a Buffett saying about uh, owning businesses so good, even an idiot could run. Mm. Um, I'm yeah, actually not going to go any further with that comment, but I, it, it, let's say Unilever, I don't think has been well run. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't think that's a secret. And I think it's managed to, let's to be fair to it, plod along despite that. Uh, so there's my, my there's a view of it is imagine how good it could be if it was well run um and there have been you know lots of uh i guess behind the scenes shareholder grumblings meetings with boards we've been part of, of, of a lot of that um and uh you know let's you know starting 2023 where we've got a new ceo uh we've got a new chair who's just started we will have a new cfo um we've got an intention to spend uh their, their problem is they just weren't spending for growth so they're you know r d um, as a percentage to sales, capex as a uh, as a percentage to sales, the marketing spend, all of those things uh, went downwards as they tried to deliver um, higher margins and higher dividends. And you can do that for a short period of time. You can't do it for a long period of time because then you don't have any product to sell. Uh, and yeah. so we've got you know new management in who I think get that. I think I was, when we because you mentioned Diageo um, in in 2015, when you, if you look at the numbers, Diageo and Unilever spent about the same amount of marketing. I don't mean people mm-hmm. it's definitional differences, but broadly 15% of sales. And, mm-hmm. and since then, Diageo, which has done really well, uh, now spends 18 from its 15, so it's gone up. Unilever went down to 13, and you know, with with 
obvious results. This isn't. This is almost like the opposite of pharmaceuticals in that it may take a long while to find a new cancer drug. To 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 come out with a funky new can of Dan, Dove deodorant uh, and a, a new one, I don't reckon it takes that long. It just takes you know someone willing to put some some money behind some innovation. So yeah. I th I think and and you know the the valuation um, uh, is as attractive as, it, as it's been for a while. So um, I, I think this is a good moment for Unilever. I think it's gonna yeah. Be a and Unilever's got point. that uh, crown jewel, hasn't it, in India with this joint venture with uh, Hindustan? I think it is, which must means that once it does get innovation in its product set, then invest in it, then it's got a great emerging market, high growth sector in, a, in the in the most populous country in the world. Yes, indeed. So yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the most populous, it's got attractive demographics, it's got an emerging uh, uh, middle class that are still moving to urban areas. And if you move to urban areas, you spend more on FMCG, they've got the, the stories um, from a sort of demographic piece is really good for Unilever. And actually, you know, if you're while we're at it, it's good for Diageo. Um, mm. So I think um, we uh, the temptation of Diageo is I could talk to you about tequila in the US market, and they are, yeah. you know, they, they are um, the dominant player in, in in US spirits, and it's an attractive market and it's premium. It's one of the things we sort of forget about is that um, about twenty percent of its sales come from Africa. Uh, it's got this great mm. African business. Uh, it's got the, the East African brewing company, but it's also got really big positions in Nigeria. Nigeria. You, know, you talk about India being a uh, most populous country. Uh, uh, if, you, if you believe the stats, the uh, Nigeria will be by the end of uh, this century, mm. quite possibly the, the most. You know, there is very good demographics there. And, and uh, um, yeah, another fact for you to take home is that. Um, uh the uk's long been the the biggest drinker of guinness um mm -hmm. ireland was number two nigeria has overtaken ireland uh as has uh, it what guinness guinness yeah more guinness sold in nigeria now than ireland um wow well, that is incredible i know the indians like johnny walker but i didn't realize the nigerians like guinness <laughs> yeah I, I, you know, and i think i think it's i think it's, you know the idea we think about the, the it's got it's got a decent indian business it's mm -hmm. yeah i say it's dominant in um in the us we could talk about it's great scotch has it's, I think we forget about that that other piece of it. So I thought I'd mention that here. It's just sort of another, yeah, um, another sort of positive aspect. But it's you know, Diageo has grown. Um, anyway, it's, it's grown almost twice as fast in a sort of top line. The uh, uh, the, the Unilever, um, you know, we, we, it's it's growth rate over about ten, I think, possibly over twenty years. It's somewhere sort of seven or eight percent. You get a couple of percent dividend on top of that. Mm. Um, and it, and it's a machine that will will we'll keep doing it. And we're at valuations that. Um, uh, it's a similar valuation that it was on in somewhere like 2012. It hasn't been yeah. this cheap for a long while. So uh, now, yeah. now, now, now's a great moment, I think, to own to own uh, Diageo. Mm. Another one which is um, which is cheap. In fact, the whole sector's had a lot of consolidation. Is the sort of the car dealers and car distribution guys. We've had the uh, the uh, bit acquisition of Lookers. We've got sort of like a number of people sniffing around uh, Pendragon. Now I do see you own Inchcape, which yeah. is a sort of emerging emerging market more play in sort of you know car distribution. I'll take you through this one because it looks like a, a choice asset, um, sort of two point seven billion market cap on about seven times PE, which frankly again looks very reasonable so um my view is that um uk car dealerships aren't very good businesses i don't really want mm. to own them uh so why do we own inch cape is because oh, i know it's about 80 90 percent of its profits are nothing to do with uk car retail mm. what inch cape really does it is a distributor and that means that in places for instance in hong kong uh, to all intents and purposes, Inchcape is Toyota. It imports the vehicles, it does the marketing, it manages the dealerships, uh, it sets the prices. Um, and it has it is the global leader in doing this for all sorts of uh, car OEMs, from Jaguar Land Rover, uh, mentioned Toyota, uh, for Mercedes, uh, for some of the Chinese players now. Um, uh, it, it, it does distribution um, and it's, I guess it's sort of, uh, the, the big growth partly through M&A has been more recently in South America, so uh, uh, Chile particularly, but other sort of uh, South American countries where um, some of these brands want someone to, to do that for them. Uh, they've already got sort of the, the Asian uh, piece, they have some European um, uh, uh, 
distributor um, arrangements. And, that, and that's really, you know, that's what they do. Uh, and over the last sort of, you know, a decade ago, this company, it had some of these positions, but it never won any new dealerships, mm -hmm. uh, no, any uh, distribution contracts. Yeah. And for the last sort of five or six years, it's been doing it at a, you know, a reasonable rate. It's sold a lot of its retail um, and it's in this sort of higher margin, better growth uh, businesses, the competitive intensity is less, partly because it's, you know, they are the global player in doing this. So they can invest in the systems uh, and, the, and sort of data feeds back to, mm. to the OEMs that perhaps smaller uh, sort of, you know, one country uh, distribution companies can't do. Um, and the last bit I was saying is that, you know, so everyone's excited about South America. The bit to watch for Inch Cape is what's happening to them in um, in Asia. They've got the Singapore and Hong Kong markets are so pretty weird markets in terms of uh, they have their own cycles and uh, licenses for owning cars. That's about to inflect. And they've just they've just won a number of contracts in Indonesia, which is, a, you know, a big, big country. Um, and I think that yeah. that's that, that could be really material for them. So, I mean, you know, and you say on the valuation, it's on um, Inch Cape's really interesting here. Yeah. And it's a, as you say, it's a capital light model compared to the uh, the dealerships, which actually have to own the cars. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you um, now. Just another one, which is actually even cheaper, incredibly, is BP, the, oil, the integrated oil major. It's trading at less than seven times PE. I'm guessing that's because people think that the oil price is going down but if they've just looked if they looked at what's been happening in geopolitical that in israel and ukraine it doesn't seem to be any sign of the of brent decreasing anytime soon yeah you know look, we, we don't we don't have big positions in oil but i'd say that mm. the, the uh bp is a business that is transitioning and you know and that's mm. where um that's that's a long-term strategy um and that's where they're putting an increasing amount uh, of capex so in, in areas with sort of ev charging convenience retail bioenergy but equally at the same time that's being funded by cash flows from uh sort of the existing oil assets um uh, and as you say i don't think that's that you know the, the cash flows from that are going down um uh, with the the oil price where it is and so even after all the investment and you know sort of 15 or billion of capex they spend every year um uh this thing on a, a you know it, it's dividend yields only sort of four percent it's free cash flow yield is ten percent the balance sheet's pretty strong. So what you're getting there is you're, you're gonna, that cash is going to come back to us, mm. um, uh, especially if the oil price stays where it is at the moment. And that, you know, that to us, that's a sort of cash return that we can um, um, redeploy in, in, in other assets where we might have sort of, I think, more, more clear paths to long term growth. But really, it's the cash generation and the, you know, the strength of the balance sheet of BP that keep it in the portfolio. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think people forget that the oil majors have been generating, just printing money the last couple of two or three years. And on that basis, their balance sheets have probably never been stronger on a mm. on a net debt to EBITDA. Now, one, just turning again to um, sort of financials, you haven't got obviously too many other banks or anything like that, but just one you've got in there, which is a tech play, is Hargreaves Lansdowne, which is a bit of a controversial battleground stock at the moment. Does the valuation has dropped down to about 11 times PE. And I did notice that today it's, it's the most short, it's one of the most shorted stocks in the UK. It's the fifth most shorted with about a 5% um, short interest. Do you want to tell, why is it so cheap and why is it so hated by certain people? So, you know, this is a stock that was on 30 times. Like I said, we didn't own it then. We do have a sort of valuation control. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to th th think about running a portfolio of capital preservation, there are very few times if I can imagine where we would want to own something on 30 times its earnings. Um, but um, what it seems to have happened at Hargreaves is, you know, they've been very successful, but I think they've underinvested in their back office. Uh, and then they had a bit of a profit warning where they said, we need to do some catch up investment. And that was sort of, uh, you know, that, that was the thing that raised the eyebrow for us because we like companies that are investing. We particularly mm -hmm. like companies that have just gone down a lot. That, 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 that kind of, you know, so the valuation looks a lot yeah. more attractive. And they've brought some really interesting people in to, to do that. I think they're constrained on how fast they can grow simply because customer service is a really important part uh, of what they do and if you screw it up at the point when people are trying to sign up uh, you you kind of lose that um, uh, forever so there's that we've got to get through that piece of investment in the back office that always comes with a reasonable amount of risk but uh, we've got a ceo and a sort of chief technology guy who who's sort of been around to see investors over the last year or so 
both of whom actually spent a lot of time at Relics, which, you know, if mm. we get time, we might talk about. But Yeah, we'll that, talk about that next. That's a company that, that knows a thing or two about um, um, systems and data and IT. Um, and the, the, I also have a lot of faith that they'll be able to do that. The other piece is around um, the, the, you know, the, the charging structure. The regulator is on the back of the whole industry. I think even that said, um, I'm pretty, you know, we're, we're, we're factoring in uh, some margin compression here. They're, they're not out of line. They're not more expensive in, in any sort of material way than, um, than competitors. And they, they get a, you know, I, I think people perhaps in our industry start to think that somehow this all, all investment advice should be sold on price. And, and actually, um, you know, whilst it, you know, platforms aren't, aren't investment advice, they are, they do need to offer a reassurance that your money is safe and looked after and that, you know, when you're pressing the bun, button to buy a fund or whatever you're doing, that it, it's all going to work. And that people are willing to pay for that quite rightly as well. You know, we don't want to be in an industry where it's just, just the, the, the cheapest provider that w wins out everywhere. So I, I think they've got a great position here. I, I think they'll, they'll, um, that investment will come in. As you say, it's, it's absolutely uh, hated. Uh, it's gone from being over, over loved to over hated. Um, it's good to know that the the short interest is so high because I think that's a, a good sign as well. And and that we haven't touched on and I won't you know you know them that we, we need to save as a nation. We need to invest something in pensions or we're going to be in a lot of trouble. It's a that's a big incentive for the regulator and the government. It certainly should be. We need to get people saving more, and they are the uh, number one platform for doing that. Yeah, well, I, I use them and I find they're fine. So uh, I've got no problem at all. I also use AJ Bell, which is one of their biggest head to head. Mm. And they're fine as well. But frankly, there aren't that many. You know, we're talking of really scale and people who have that sort of like, you know, custodial type of operation. Then, uh, you know, you don't want to put uh, your money with people who are, you know, very small because you never know what's going to happen. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think you're right there. Looks Looks far too cheap. Um, now, just let's go to Relics then, the, the data provider. What's your, sort of your, your latest on this one? It was it's the old Reed Els, Elsevier yeah, type yeah. product, but it just was it B two B data services for things like regulate industries, financial, healthcare, and stuff like that. Would it will it ever be disintermediated by generative AI? Um... I thought you were going to say, would it ever be split up? And we'd have that, that conversation. Yeah, okay. Well, is that as well? Is this, that as well? This is a, you know, this is another conglomerate business and I quite like conglomerate businesses and I can't pretend that, you know, that they'll tell you that there's probably some overlap, but they're, they're I think the world's biggest, um, I'm mm. sure of scientific journals, but they've also got this sort of uh, RBI um, uh, uh, data business where they are interested in sort of areas like uh, uh, cyber crime, identity protection. Uh, they sell uh, 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 products to insurance companies in terms that they help people buy in, uh, car insurance. Um, they've got a legal division, which is kind of like Bloomberg for, for lawyers. I would think of it that way, LexisNexis. So uh, there's, um, there, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's more sort of, it's a, uh, a business model designed for the way we, we think about investing because these are often subscription businesses. So you've got that low volatility. They come back every year. You've got pricing power. The high return on capital, uh, they generate lots of cash. Um, so that's that's why we own we we, we own um, uh, relics, uh, mm. and it and it you know it generates cash, it invests the cash in new da data sets, it moves into new product areas, new geographies. It so, same as Jaja, it looks like a machine. It's it, it's delivered sort of in a, in a return. If you add back the dividend, we get that sort of ten percent every year. It gets it, the mm. business become bigger, stronger. Um, so is AI going to come and disintermediate it? Well, I think it's, it's most vulnerable probably in its legal division because that you're, you're, you know, what's called people's AI is generative AI. So yeah. lawyers generate reports. Um, could AI do that? And I think the, the answer to that is absolutely yes. So it's almost kind of an oligopoly, this market they have with Thompson. Um, mm. uh, Thompson have uh, just sort of acquired uh, an AI business that will sit on top of all their data. Uh, Reader about to launch theirs. Um, but the, I think the important thing to, to know is where, where I think you're going to be in trouble is this, if you're a business where the data set is in the public domain and AI can just reach out and grab it. And that's not uh, not uh, the case uh, for pretty much uh, all of Reed's data. So whilst, you know, the, of course, statutes there, case laws there, but the analytics, uh, the commentary, the understanding of it is proprietary and that's why people buy it. So I'm afraid that I think that the, the downside for AI in, in particular sort of in legal is, is going to be probably felt by lawyers because you might need fewer of them. 
yeah. but I don't see the likes of Clifford Charts cutting their subscription to to the legal databases, especially when they've got AI sitting on top of them. Mm. That's they may the actually spend more on it to replace some of their lawyers. I, I, th I think so. I think so. And look, it's a conglomerate. Uh, LexisNexis isn't the biggest piece of it. If it starts to, to eat into it, Reed doesn't fall over because, um, you know, it, 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 we've got those diversified cash flows coming through. Yeah. What about um, Experian with the credit checker? Because you'd have thought sort of like, I mean, there's so many of, uh, sort of regenerative AI, which is trying to um be impose individuals as in like you know to basically be you've got cyber criminals who are trying to be somebody else then uh, actually credit checkers and id sort of verification guys like uh experian probably probably will benefit i imagine well yeah i mean i think um because then you know there's different types of uh of ai and if you're you know you say yeah. this to experian they point out we've, we've, we've this is what we've been using for years this yeah. is the, the you know the clever stuff uh mm. that is making you know what looks like you um just verifying your identity when you make a a, a transaction on your phone there's a whole mm. range of other stuff going on there um and the data that sits behind that you'll be pleased to know isn't in the public domain it's owned by yeah. um uh Experian. and so i you know it's not Typing into chat GPT, you know, is Paul Hill going to pay his credit card back? Isn't going to get the answer uh, that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that that you might need if you're a credit card company. So I think Experian are uh, finding that that respect. And look, their markets are growing. They're, they're, they're using more of this data for online marketing. Um, they're just like reader, uh, you know, in, uh, in sort of online fraud, identity protection. Um, uh, the credit decision in peace we, we know about they're selling more of it into markets like healthcare and the other thing that you know people forget about Experian is you know it's dominant in the U US it's one of the the, the was the, the biggest player in its markets in the US uh, but it's also got this really interesting and it's the material business in Brazil and Brazil um, the Brazilian credit market is only just opening up it has a whole range of regulatory issues around the sort of data that you could hold on people and that's changed uh, and Experian are the number one there. It's a big country and it's growing, you know, really quickly. And I think, you know, that that's going to propel um, Experian from here. Yeah. And there's lots of sort of like emerging market growth, isn't it? Because m most people, you know, have got to, they pay for stuff on their phones. They don't do any sort of like, I haven't got, I haven't got a credit card, a lot of emerging markets, mm. certainly. So uh, <clears throat> now just turning to an area that you touched on right at the start, the consumer, the health of consumer, you've got best in class retail or clothes retailer is next. Do you want to take us through this one? Because it, I mean, obviously the guy there, um, I think it's Simon Wolfson, isn't it? Has just been doing a fabulous job for 20 odd years and taking market share hand over fist actually. Um, and it trades on roughly around about 12 times. So uh, not expensive. Yeah, look, um, yeah, but, but you're, you're right. It's best in class. I th Next is run in a way that I wish other UK companies were run. Mm. Um, it's run for the long term. It reinvests uh, in its profits in um, uh, back in for, to future growth, and uh, it doesn't make its accounts up. Uh, as in, mm. it, it yeah. try and find a negative exception in the last sort of twenty years of any significant size at Next, and you won't. I can't think of another company I can say that about. It, it, in that sense, the, the accounts are that clean. It's it's sort of remarkable. Mm. So when people compare it to other retailers and say, "Well, this one's a little bit cheaper." I think, yeah, you add, in, add back the exceptionals and the rest of it, and you'll see that yeah. you know, Next is, is, I think, a, a fantastic prospect in that, that respect. The other thing to bear in mind is, right, is I don't know, it's, I sometimes joke that Next is our tech play. Uh, something like 80% of the profits come from its sort of directory and online business now. The, the, mm. It's not really, um, from a profit perspective, about the stores. Uh, it is the UK's largest clothes online clothes retailer. It is bigger than ASOS or Boohoo or the, the others. Mm. Um, and the bit that's growing isn't really the buying next clothes online. You may or may know not. You, you know more about this, I think, if you have kids, because it seems people who have kids uh, seem to buy lots of their, yeah. their school wear on next. And then at that point, you might realise when you do that that it's not just next clothes. If you want to buy, you know, I, I don't know Ralph Lauren or Adidas or whatever else. Mm. Um, it's becoming the number one platform. And then on top of that, they're now outsourcing effectively an outsourcing service for other retailers. So GAT closed effectively its operations yeah. in the UK, goes into Next. And so you know, to give you a clue, if you look at the 
the the next website and the gap website and the jewels website and the reese website and the made.com website they're going to look pretty similar because the 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 technology the data um the logistics uh behind this uh is next uh yeah. and they're making you know good money out of doing this i think this is you know that they are leading the market in this in this area mm. it's, a, it's a growing market and the, that investment's paying off. So uh... yeah, you might as well use that economies of scale and that infrastructure, which is already be there to uh, to make mo- to help other people, but to make money, particularly if they're not direct competitors. So uh, yeah, that actually ticks the box. So the, it? the Amazon of UK clothes retail it is. It's uh, not not just yeah. about the next brand. Okay, well, just moving on to uh, consumers. Obviously, it's been, since we've all emerged from our lockdowns, there's been a lot of revenge spending on sort of travel, and uh, both internally in the UK and uh, at airports and routes. You've got two Whitbread, which is obviously owns the uh, uh, premier uh, hotels, and my wife is uh, a massive fan of it. And then uh, you've got SSP, which does snort snacks and uh, food and uh, upper crust sort of like you know sandwiches at uh, at airports and railway stations. do you want to take us through both of these because they've just had absolute barnstormer performances the last 12 months but i guess the question is is it going to continue well so uh, with bread and uh, particularly you know premier inn is a wonderful story of a company sort of as i would think it's sort of doing the right thing in terms of you know, mm. reinvesting uh organically uh, to grow its portfolio, but also investing in the product in, in, in terms of customer service, making sure the hotels look good. Um, and your wife is not alone. And uh, they, they proudly show these charts of uh, customer perception for the hotel brands in the UK mm. with kind of quality and value. They, they're yeah. out on their own in this. Yeah. They, are, they are so far over the right in terms of the, 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 the best perceived for value. Uh, but they uh, they're also at the top of the charts bar one, which is Hilton for quality. No one else looks mm. like them. The, this perception mm. that you can get. It's a rare thing. You can. Yeah. Um, you can have, you know, the, the, one of the highest rated for quality at by far the best rated for value. And that's how you sort of grow market share. So they had about 6% market share in 2010. They've got 12% now. Uh, I think they've further to go. And, you know, there are scale advantages now in terms of mm. not just sort of brand awareness. So you, you know, you have to book it on their website, so you don't pay the massive commissions you pay for things like booking.com. Uh, there's brand where, you know, they, they advertise, you'll see them advertising on the television because they can afford to do that because they've got scale. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, sourcing is a, is a big thing. So you've got, I think there's further to go in that respect. And then there's the German expansion. I've been over, uh, I've been over to uh, to visit some Premier Inns in Hamburg. I can tell you they look okay. very much like Premier well. Inn over here. There's like a slight German twist. Yeah, um, okay. But uh, they're, they're kind of, you know, they did a lot of research. They picked the German market. We're some way into it now. We're not profitable yet. So if you're valuing it, you know, we don't really value it on a PE. But if you did, you're getting nothing for that. In fact, it's a negative. Mm. Uh, and yet we've got, I think, about 9,000 rooms so far. There's another 7,000 in the pipeline. Profitability is becoming, you know, the, the trajectory looks good. Uh, mm. At some point, and I think it might be towards the end of 24, they may break even in that business, at which yeah. point, um, you know, that, that's going to propel earnings growth uh, if they're successful there. So Whitbread is a great, mm. great sort of UK success story, really. Yeah. And I guess their competition actually in the UK, particularly for the sort of the value, high quality type uh, residents that they do, in the, certainly for small mum and pops, they've started to go out the business, haven't they? Because they can't afford to invest in the bigger infrastructure that they need to be able to compete against them. Yeah, and then, and you know, sadly that is that is the case that, that really mm. these brands are yeah you, you know they, they'll um uh, you think of them as perhaps they take market share from something that's less well invested like travel lodge but the real the sort of soft underbelly is the independent hotels that don't have the scale yeah. they're not sort of necessarily purpose built uh, modern and 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 capacity is going out of the market mm. uh, and, and the, the capacity is going out at an accelerating rate. And they're not coming back. These, these these hotels are being converted for other uses, for residential and so forth. So there's a mm. there's an actually a, a supply shrinkage, particularly in the independent sector, and it's been like that for for a while now uh, in the mm. UK. What about SSP? They obviously this you know you, everybody knows their brands at, uh, at railway stations and uh, and airports. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, so they. <laughs> I've forgotten the, the name of the one at uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the railways, but it, I, I, I was 
piece it's of up a crust isn't it is they, but they do have a crust but they've got this one of the regional railways uh that uh that i can't recall now but it's not very good yeah, i was okay. picking on them for it when last time i met them but in general oh, okay. SFs, sps are a, a really well-run business and it has mm. taken share in its market um there's two big players who do this and it's big the big thing really is we, we own it for a sort of uh, uh, they run um, food outlets in airports and they do this mm. across the globe and it's them as sort of auto grill. They've got about between them about a quarter of the market. Um, and there are scale benefits to doing this because mm. it's complicated. Uh, if you're, you, know, you don't necessarily think about it when you go in to, 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 to grab something to eat in an airport, particularly airside. But all those staff have to go through security in and out every day. Every supplier has to. Mm. Uh, it's a complex operation. Uh, the long term contracts to do it. But once you're in there, um, as, as you also know, is that it's not cheap because you yeah. are a trapped customer. You can't go anywhere else. Uh, yeah. You've got that. And, and they may run, you know, uh, a, a significant number of those outlets. Mm. Um, so this is, you know, good business with guaranteed footfall, uh, a market that's consolidating. They're one of the big players that are consolidating it. There are mm. Global opportunities. Uh, and then it goes right back to the beginning. Um, well, I sort of mentioned that airport uh, terminal uh, that's been built at JFK. Uh, the, the world is in, in still investing in airport infrastructure. So um, they, they've got reasonable visibility. They've, they've won loads of contracts they couldn't build out during COVID. So I think they've got another sort of 700 million on a, on a base of 3 billion to build out over the next couple of years. So we're going to see good growth there, I think. Yeah, and they're actually on a cheaper valuation than the likes of Greg's, but they're they're right up there, I think. So. Well, it's the earnings growth, really. This is still yeah. recovering. It's just really now got to the point where we've recovered post COVID. It, it's taken a while. Yeah. We'd expect, you know, in terms of um, air travel. But oh, the, the other thing, the, your, the last last thing, I think, a boon for them is that we're all having to spend more time in airports. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice that if you could just run through. But the, the longer you and particularly you and the family mm. are there, the more you're going to spend on food. Yeah, and once they stop the railway strikes, that'll help them at, uh, at Euston as well. Yeah. Now, uh, now, just in terms of the sort of the backdrop, you're obviously cautious. Anything that the investors could take away as sort of like, you know, what not to do going forward? I mean, I don't know, chase stuff or avoid over-leveraged balance sheets, the, the sort of the key mistakes that people might, you know, sort of like, you know, make and just try and sort of watch out for. Well, uh, there's lots. Uh, and I think <laughs> chasing stuff is a good idea. Remaining patient is a good idea. Not, you know, not, not I don't know, it's, it's our ethos. Don't, we don't need to be heroic. I'm, I'm, not, I mean, yeah. I'm running a fund so that people who invest in it might be able to retire. I don't need to, mm. you know, um, put everything on, on black and hope for the best. Uh, we buy, <laughs> you know, uh, businesses that are cash generative established that I think are going to be bigger in sort of a 10 years time. The thing to watch out yeah. for, I know, you know, if you're going to pick one thing, I think that the, the the, the the perhaps most topical is you need to watch out for balance sheets so we mm -hmm. you know we're in a privileged position we get to meet lots of finance directors but if you look at where sort of you know the 10-year yields are here or in the us and therefore you know add a bit on for where where um corporate uh lending is going to be um the people of the finance directors now have not been the finance directors of companies in an era where borrowing not just wasn't this expensive but where it even mattered you know, because the rates were so low, so many people, you know, yeah. covenant, light, well, whatever, uh, let's just get more debt. And they haven't really, I think, had to experience that. And I think number will get caught out. They, you know, they think they've got great relationships with the banks and then they find, oh, my God, the, the, you know, when I started, um, I remember a guy said, I remember he pulled up and it was like early on in my career, if I didn't know, I didn't know the interest cover of a, of a particular company I was about to talk about. No one talks about interest cover anymore. It's all this net debt to EBITDA. Mm. They're going to talk about yeah. interest cover again because you yeah. need to have the profits to pay the interest bill and the interest bill yeah. is going up. So that's the number one thing to look at, look for. Watch the balance sheets and watch. make sure you've got you know, stable cash flow businesses uh, where you've got debt that can actually uh, service those interest costs. Yeah. And what about um, sort of like, you know, growth? Because there is a temptation that you go into things like, you know, the Magnificent Seven, where essentially you've got growth and you've got good balance sheets, but actually the peg ratios are just stratospheric, like Apple, it's about four times sort of like, you know, yeah, it's about, it's about, you know, four times something like that. Yeah. And, and there, there are definitely areas of the market and, you, you know, it's, you know, so we, we, everyone knows about the tech names. It will be everywhere else as well. And, mm. you know, obviously that anything with vaguely touching AI will be 
Uh, yeah. Uh, if, if you're perceived to be on the wrong, the right side of it, and you're in the, the you know, the AI ETF bucket, but we can never wait, never get our way through that. And you know, we've talked about a lot of companies where I think that there are good growth prospects because you know we're looking at those structural themes. So whether it is you know we talk about Unilever, Diageo, we, you know, and that sort of emerging market exposure. Um, we, we we talked about sort of areas touched by infrastructure like. Uh, uh, early on, like uh, Ashtead, mm. CRH, uh, energy. You know, we know energy transitions happening. We know um, the infrastructure spends uh, going on. We know uh, emerging market countries are going to continue uh, to have a sort of a, a, a growing middle class consumer who's going to spend. Um, why not back those things? Because then I don't, I don't yeah. have to sit there and worry too much about uh, you know next week's GDP figures. Let, let's let's think about the long term trends that you know in theory ought to. Uh, align with uh the the kind of the time horizon of most of the the clients uh in in the funds that we run mm. oh, and the last one was obviously which is cheap to cheap valuation and old economy stocks and stuff but the banks why how come the fund has avoided the banks i mean what was quite enlightening is that they've had the q3 us earnings season they all came out with good sort of like you know numbers and decent expectations but the, the shares have rolled off which says to me they've still got a bit of hidden ordinance in their balance sheet as interest rates rise and they've got those potential unrealized losses on their on their asset books well Paul, i've, I've uh, so uh if the interest of time i can tell you that i've written so uh, i think I'm, uh, um it's probably somewhere on, on linkedin i've posted a piece on uh why we don't own banks uh, and, and there are a number of reasons for that. I don't think many people over the last sort of decade, you know, by the time you reach retirement, I don't know how many mm. people are going to rub their hands and go, oh, God, I wish I'd owned some UK banks. I think <laughs> uh, the balance sheet structure, uh, it, you know, these are still highly, highly leveraged vehicles. They're not as bad as they were in 2007, but there's a lot of leverage here. There is a lot of uh, uh, political, I think, animosity as to, you know, as soon as they start to make a profit, they're called in to see the treasury. Uh, so yeah. I think that they have that uh, against them. It's a highly, highly competitive market. Um, mm. You know, exciting is, is that everyone's, you know, um, that they might be able to make a bigger uh, net interest margin. As soon as we get to higher rates, then the, the, the amount of choice you've got, if you want to to, to, to chase that, um, is it, it, startling. So, uh, and the, the last piece is, you know, Surely we can find some better ideas than the bank. Yeah, okay. All right, brilliant. Okay, well, thanks again for your time there, Michael. If anybody wants to invest in the uh, the J.O. Hambro uh, funds, how best to do that? Yeah, you can. Well, uh, we're, we're on every platform going, uh, the J.O. Hambro UK Opportunities Fund. So I, I, I don't think we're, we're shy on any of the platforms. And then you can go through our website and there's, there are sales contacts um, where, who will be more than keen, I should imagine, to, to get back to you. Brilliant. Okay, well, I'll have a look on uh, on AJ Bell and uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne as well. So uh, make, make sure it's Hargreaves. Let's... Okay, it's Hargreaves. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy them through Hargreaves. Okay, well, thanks very much, Michael, and look forward in uh, in touching bases about six months' time. Thanks, Paul.